Howdy everybody. Today I wanted to talk about why psychotherapy takes as long as it does, or maybe even just wonder about how long should psychotherapy take? I think this is a popular topic, especially amongst folks who have to deal with managed care. Um, how long should psychotherapy be? You know, managed care tends to think it should be relatively short. But it also comes up a lot related to research in psychotherapy because a lot of research on psychotherapy is based around short-term models. So let's talk about what that actually looks like in real life for a lot of folks in private practice or who are working with patients. Um, so I was going through a hike this morning and I was reading a book on business that someone recommended to me. I'm considering some new ideas, so I've been talking to some folks and getting some suggestions. And the book looks good, it's helpful, it's sort of one of these um, I would say sort of capitalism fables that combines ideas about personal growth and self-actualization with business and entrepreneurship, which is a, you know, a popular myth, modern myth, I would say, can be inspiring. But one of, one of the things that the book said was, you know, it's very important for people who start a business to become aware of their core beliefs. And then once you're aware of your core beliefs, you can simply let them go. And I was listening to that and I thought, well, I'm obviously in favor of being aware of one's core beliefs. I could imagine how they're related to business, but the part that I disagreed with was, boy, I don't think it's just so easy to let them go. <laughs> like once you're aware of them, you just can't snap your fingers and go, oh, well, now I'm aware of that. So now I'm no longer held uh, hostage by it. In my opinion, I don't think it's so simplistic. Um, or that easy. And the researcher in Control Mastery seems to back that up, and as well as a lot of other psychotherapy research seems to discuss why that might not be so uh, why that not might not be so simple. And I want to talk about that today because I think it's a really important aspect of psychotherapy and understanding how long psychotherapy should take or how long it does take for certain folks. Uh, I think it can make clinicians feel more patient and more understanding, and I think it can relieve patients of uh, unrealistic expectations about how fast psychotherapy is supposed to uh, take effect or how profoundly they're supposed to benefit, how quickly. Um, I also think in the long run, imagining the future of psychotherapy, it's going to be important to establish for care you know, for the, the standards of care, what is reasonable to expect in terms of how quickly people can see progress and then how long are those uh, gains supposed to last. So in order to do that, I think it's really important to go back a couple steps and talk about what beliefs are, at least from a control mastery perspective, and then how they function in psychotherapy. So it's hard to talk about this stuff without sounding a little bit, I don't know, big picture or stony, but we'll give it our best shot. So uh, we're born into the world, human beings, and then we have to understand how do I navigate the world and how does it operate? And here's where things get a little stony, but I think it actually comports with really concrete neuroscience uh, around, the, around this topic. The scholarship around this is really solid. So the idea is that as humans, we filter our perception of the world through our senses and that as small individual human beings we never have access to all the data in any given situation at any given time we don't know all the angles we can't read other people's minds we don't understand why certain things happen and so we're forced to develop stories heuristics and beliefs about why things happen the way they do and because we're always functioning from uh, incomplete information and because we are biased towards our own viewpoint or our own data that we take in and we can't know what we don't know, the beliefs and heuristics that we form about the world are inherently incomplete. I think that's probably not controversial, but I just want to really push that so everybody understands where I'm coming from on this. So what that means is that there is a foundation of reality that exists in the world independent of our beliefs. Now, there are some metaphysical systems that challenge that, but I'm going to just go, we're just going to go with a rational materialistic standpoint from right now that there's an objective reality outside of our belief systems. And that our beliefs about the world nest on top of that, they model it, but are always incomplete and somewhat wrong. And then we live our lives based on those beliefs as if they are reality, because that's just how human beings function. And it's too complicated to always be remembering, oh, well, this is an approximation of reality. So I think this is how gravity works, but I know that it's only a heuristic based on my past experiences. Nobody would get anything done and we would all be insufferably annoying head cases anyway. 
So we just incorporate a belief about the world and act as if that is reality because that's what's most expedient for us. So um, I use the example of gravity and we're going to come back to that. So, well, well let's, let's stay with it right now, actually. So we all have a belief about how gravity works and there are principles that we've now discovered about how reality works and hopefully our beliefs match those principles otherwise we're going to have a hard time every time we we deal with the second story of a building so once we have that belief about how gravity works so it's pretty much encoded into our mind and our body and so when we get to the edge of a cliff we start to feel a tremendous amount of fear because we have this inherent belief oh, if I step over this, gravity will take over, I will fall. And then we have other beliefs about, well, if I fall X amount of space, that's going to hurt myself. It's not fully a conscious process. It's encoded physically into us about, oh, gosh, this is how the world works. When we talk about beliefs in control mastery, when we talk about um, pathogenic beliefs, other groups call them schemas or core beliefs, but that's really the level of experience that we're trying to describe. It's not strictly a cognitive process. It's encoded in our reactions, our physicality, our, 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 and then also our cognition. So it's the whole system. So once we establish these beliefs about how the world works, we're really not meant to violate them because they signal to us what's safe and what's dangerous and also just what's possible. So once they're there, we're not meant to violate them. And then they're also not meant to change easily because if our beliefs were subject to easy, quick change, the world would be profoundly disorienting. We wouldn't be able to function day to day because our beliefs would be constantly shifted and buffeted by every new piece of information. There are people whose beliefs are easily changed and we wind up calling them things like naive or, uh, well, mostly naive or even childlike because children have beliefs that are more malleable than adults. So how does that relate to therapy? Well, People possess any number of beliefs about the world and their lives, and people come to therapy when they have a goal or a desire or something in their life that they want that is in conflict with their core, their set of beliefs about what's possible. And they're coming to therapy with the hopes that they could change those beliefs and achieve their goals or move in a new direction. However, that makes it sound more simple than it really is. Think about, again, the belief about gravity. That if, if we hold a belief in gravity, but we want to fly, for example, that sounds completely impossible. And to go to therapy for somebody to tell us, no, 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 it's possible that you can fly will just sound like craziness for a long time. If you were actually to believe that you could violate gravity and fly at certain times, you would need to have repeated different experiences that showed you that that was possible. Now, as silly as this example sounds, this is actually true, right? We have things that allow us to fly. We have airplanes. But can you imagine how scared people were to get on airplanes at the beginning? And for a long time, actually, people said, this is impossible. This is craziness. And they needed to see proof that it was actually possible to build something that would then interact with gravity differently and allow human beings to fly. And even after people saw it, it took a long time for people to take that up. And all of a sudden, now in this world, because it's so common, we've seen it happen, and maybe some of us, most of us have experienced it, it is not something that is as frightening anymore, but it took a long time. You can think of therapy as actually somewhat similar to that. So if you come, if somebody comes in and they've been horribly neglected their whole life and they're trying to develop a relationship with somebody that's healthy, and they keep doing things to sabotage, they keep doing things that get in the way of developing a sense of intimacy, and you tell them point blank, you are worthy of a relationship, they might have some interest in that, but it sounds like craziness to them, or it doesn't actually penetrate the, deeply enough for them to be able to use it. Somebody is going to need in therapy repeated experiences of being worthy of care in order to internalize that. And they're probably going to need the therapist also to point out experiences they're already having that do support the new belief system. Because people, due to, the, uh, due to our biases, we tend to sort out things that violate our beliefs as exceptions to the rule and things that support our beliefs as, oh yeah, that's more support for it. So people need a lot of help to recognize that there are things happening in their life that support the development of a new belief. So that's one of the primary functions of therapy is to help people have new experiences that support new beliefs and to point out experiences they're already having that support new beliefs. But it's not so simple. 
Let me give another example that was given to me by Dr. John Curtis that I, uh, I reference a lot because I think it's really helpful. And that's the metaphor of food poisoning when it comes to belief. So think of the last time that you had food poisoning. You know, if you, if you had, hopefully you haven't, although for this example, it would be helpful if you had, but you know, food poisoning is terrible. It's definitely one of the worst experiences people can have, I think. It's just so miserable. So most of the time when people get food poisoning, they think they know what it's from, right? And they usually have an association to that. And so what most people experience when they have food poisoning is if, if you think of the thing that gave you food poisoning last, how quick were you to eat that food again? Probably not so eager. And what's really interesting about that is maybe it was a food that you'd eaten a bunch of times before. So say the last thing I got food poisoning from was a burrito. I enjoy burritos a lot. I've eaten hundreds of burritos in my life. And I got food poisoning from one burrito. Now, what was really fascinating about that is logically I could tell myself, I can eat burritos again. That was the exception to the rule. Burritos are generally safe. There was nothing about burritos inherently that has food poisoning. It was like poor food safety on the part of somebody handling the ingredients of the burrito one time. Nothing about burritos is the problem. But logically, I could know that. But nonetheless, when I smelled burritos and I had a burrito in front of me, I would start to sweat. My stomach would churn. I would feel nauseous and I would feel this immediate revulsion to it. And it was very difficult for me to get over that, to do it anyway. I needed repeated exposure to burritos to loosen the belief that burritos were not dangerous. So even though consciously I thought they weren't dangerous, unconsciously my body did not agree with me and was very reluctant to get on board with that. That is the appropriate metaphor to imagine what people are doing in therapy. People are trying to violate and change beliefs that were formed at times where those beliefs t were, the, were the difference between life and death or inclusion and uh, uh, exile. And they're very, very strongly held, oftentimes very rigid, and held because they were protective for a long time, because they were about, they, they were the similar to gravity. Like, I don't want to violate gravity because I'm in tremendous danger. I don't want to believe that I'm allowed to have a relationship that's meaningful and supportive because then I will be inevitably disappointed, hurt, or exploited. So psychotherapy takes a while because people often need repeated experiences to overcome a negative core belief and they need to have them in ways that are powerful enough to actually impact the, the belief itself. So, you know, one of the earliest essays that Freud wrote about was working and reworking through or something. I'm forgetting the title at the moment, but it was because experiences, it was one of the early observations of therapy is that you could work through something, you could consciously identify a belief, but then you would need to work through it again and again and again. This is even true in behavioral, uh, the, the behavioral wing of psychotherapy, right? Like one experience of exposure therapy towards a phobia or one experience of exposure therapy towards fears at the root of OCD is not enough to overcome it. You have to have repeated trials of it over and over and over again to slowly create extinction in the response. And I think that beliefs that have to do with relationships and how the world works are more complex and harder to isolate than beliefs like a phobia, for example, which might be more circumscribed and easy to say, okay, we can develop an exposure to this. They're more complex, but control mastery creates the framework to understand what those beliefs are and what the types of exposures people need in the relationship in therapy to start to feel safe enough to surrender their old beliefs. So the question of how long does psychotherapy take or why does it take so long is it depends, but it's probably not as quick as a lot of managed care companies would wish it to be. Because these beliefs are really intrinsic to people's sense of safety and how they function in the world, they're naturally not going to relinquish them easily. They will need repeated experiences and they will need to be confirmed over and over again that they're safe. In my experience, what happens in therapy actually is people wind up confronting the same core belief repeatedly, but almost at what I imagine is like different altitudes of their life. So for example, say somebody believes um, they're not worthy of love or a stable life, right? That's a very simple but profound core belief. 
Now imagine they start treatment with you when they're heavily drinking and they want to stop drinking. So a lot of your work early on works on limiting alcohol use, ways to help protect themselves from alcohol cravings, but also about the fundamental belief, do I, do I deserve a, a, a sober life, right? So that's the first layer that they confront the belief in. So, that, so let's say they succeed at that and they start to improve and then all of a sudden they want a good job, but now they don't feel worthy of a good life again. And now it comes up in the context of, am I allowed to have a job that I like that pays well, for example? So you do a lot of work on it. It looks very different on the surface, but in spirit, it's really about the same core belief of, am I worthy of this? So send, they do have some success at that, then they go around the, you know, they keep doing other stuff, their success in other areas, because they don't have beliefs that limit them in other areas. And then they get into a relationship that's good for the first time. And then the same core belief comes up again. I'm not worthy of having a good life. I'm not worthy of having a stable life. The relationship doesn't fit. So you work on that, work on that. And so on and so forth it goes where oftentimes people's lives, hopefully if psychotherapy is going well, sort of spiraling upward. They're improving holistically across many domains. And then they get stuck again at the area where the core belief comes up. So in my experience, people need to work through the same core belief many, many times. And then each little ring of that spiral, those multiple trials and experiences that they have to overcome the core belief at that level, then they spiral up into a new area of their life, then they need to work on it again at a different level. So that's just a metaphor that I use. I wouldn't stand behind that as empirically validated. So just take that with a grain of salt. Um, but I do think that working through core beliefs again and again is, is just an inevitable part of therapy. And for a lot of people, it can take a long time. And especially if they want to be in therapy for a period of time, they can find more and more areas where they're going to need to work through it. And then they may not meet the criteria of a diagnosis after a certain point, but they still are working very diligently to lead a meaningful, rewarding life. Um, so how long does psychotherapy take? I don't know. It depends, <laughs> but probably a little bit longer than a lot of managed care companies would wish for.